I didn't want to know what, what was said there. Okay, let's, uh, let's begin with prayer. Our Father, we thank you for yet another time to look into the principles of your word. We ask for wisdom and discernment and uh, keen minds that we might rightly apply the things that we read. I pray, Father, that um, you would bless the words of my mouth and that what would be communicated would not be things of my own mind, but rather things of yours as you've revealed them to us in the spirit. And yet give us uh, wisdom to understand the times in which we're living so that we could um, bring to bear the full force of the gospel and the principles of scripture that we might live wisely in this world and be a good witness for you and glorify you in holiness and righteousness. And we pray these things in faith. Amen. Okay. Uh, I think Pastor Paul said some time ago that we were going to start a study on um, union with Christ, and we are, but not today. Um, so that, that subject uh, is going to is still under development, uh, as is the one that I'm going to talk on today as well. So today, uh, this is a subject that I've wanted to study for some time, and so, of course, the, right, the way to make yourself study something is to offer to teach it, so that's what I'm doing. Um, we're going to begin a study in a cr Christian perspective on technology. Um, this has been interesting to me for some time because I think we live in a very unique time right now. Uh, an explosive time in regard to technology and its effects on people, and yet the things that we're experiencing are not unprecedented in history. Uh, it's just the rate <laughs> that we're experiencing them, I think, that is unprecedented in history. And as I've struggled with this area myself, I've um, found myself sort of wanting biblical moorings, if you will, things to lash myself to that I can grab hold of as everything around me seems to swim. And I know that um, uh, my children and uh, the generation slightly above them that are already in college and so on right now, uh, especially, are, are, uh, are in it fully. Whether they're struggling or not is another question, I think. So, um, so that's what we're going to look at, a Christian perspective on technology. Um, as I said, I believe this is one of the greatest challenges of the day. I am using my iPad, by the way, to, for my notes, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Um, I, let me start by saying what I do not intend to do here. Um, I don't intend to convince you to give up your iPhone or your iPad or your GPS Garmin or your Roomba or whatever. Um, similarly, I don't intend to convince you to buy uh, an iPhone, an iPad, a GPS device, or a Roomba. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, rather, uh, well, I don't intend... Uh, to convince you to sell your possessions and move to the woods in Coosa County. God bless Coosa County. <laughs> you know what? I wrote this without even thinking about this, Tim. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Elmore County. Yeah, Elmore County. Um, and I don't intend to inform you of all the latest gadgets so that we can all just proclaim that's so cool. Uh, instead, what I'm hoping to do is help us understand a little bit about what technology is and how it affects us in our uh, daily experience, and also then to see it um, from a kingdom perspective and to understand what role it ought to have in our lives um, as we make our way here. And then finally, uh, and this in a couple of weeks, hopefully to develop a scheme for adopting technology wisely. Um, right now, I think the scheme is yes. Uh, basically, we just, uh, as soon as possible, when can I get started? Uh, that's basically, I think, the default scheme. And uh, we're going to look a little more carefully at that in a, a future study. So as um, Stan said many years ago, every good Bible study begins with preliminary considerations. So indeed, that's where we're going to start today. In fact, I'm actually not going to start, I'm not going to talk about technology at all today, but rather hopefully lay some foundations and a groundwork uh, into which we can, and that the uh, puns are almost unavoidable here, something that we can plug technology into uh, as we begin to think about what to do with this subject. So let's begin with the big, big picture. Um, long ago in eternity past, God elected a people to be called by his name. Amen. Yeah, they have been, are, and will be his chosen ones saved through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Yeah, so that's the big, big picture. And um, we'll drill down a little bit more on that here in just a minute. So uh, we were not actually elected to be whisked away and taken into heaven. Uh, in fact, the Apostle Paul wrestles with that um, himself in the book of Philippians, as we'll look at in just a moment. Uh, even though selfishly it might be best for us just to kind of go off to be with the Lord, right? I mean, that's actually what he says in Philippians 1. But then he says at the same time, no, that's not why, what, what God has for me, because uh, if I stay in this life, I can participate in the progress and joy in the faith of uh, the Philippians and for us of other saints. And only by living in this life can we glorify God on the earth. So we'll have eternity actually to spend with Jesus, and that's going to be glorious, is it not? And so if we get there a year earlier, we actually don't have any more time with him, right? Because infinity plus one is infinity for the, you math guys. Yeah, so we've got a math guy in the, in the front here. So we've got all the time in the world, but we have just a span here to invest in building Christ's kingdom on the earth. And God has called us to a very particular task there that we're going to look at today. Um, so the big, big picture then is to live in such a way that God is most glorified in the time, the precious time that we spend here. And he's given us resources that we're going to use to his glory in so doing. Um, so we're attempting to display his greatness, as it were, with all of our thinking, with all of our words, and with all of our deeds. That is the big, big picture. And so as we think about these other issues and our culture and what's going on around us, I'm, I'm begging our, our us and myself, actually, to keep that in mind and just to continually be asking, is what I'm doing and thinking uh, and believing and saying, is it moving the kingdom? Is it advancing the kingdom, both in my own life and in my heart and in society at large and in the church? That, I think, is the, the big, big uh, issue. So what does it mean actually to glorify God? Now, that's a huge subject, obviously, and um, I'm not qualified to fully unpack it and certainly not going to try to do so right now. Um, Rather, I want to offer just two broad categories of glorifying God. If that's our, our chief purpose in life, um, I want to offer two broad categories for us to think about glorifying God and who we are and what we do. Okay, who we are and what we do. Okay, let's let's turn to First Thessalonians four. First Thessalonians chapter four. <clears throat> and start again, verse one, first Thessalonians four. The question is what did God want us doing? Okay, what does he want us doing? Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Now that's a great phrase, right? This is the will of God. We're all the time asking, well, what's God's will? Okay, here you go. I don't mean that flippantly, but this is just so such a comprehensive phrase that follows your sanctification. Okay, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Um, and then, what does that mean? That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, this was addressing a particular sin, but 
The concept is much more comprehensive, of course. God has called us to sanctification, holiness of life in every aspect, not, not just in the sexual uh, domain, but in every sphere of life. God calls us to sanctification, which means, in a nutshell, becoming more and more conformed to the image of Christ, right? As it says in, in Romans chapter 8, to be conformed to the image of Christ. That is the big, big picture. Okay, so that's the who we are part. Taking on the very character of Christ and being like him in our character and in our souls. That's what we're trying to do. By the way, I'm just going to keep going, but uh, I more than encourage you to uh, ask questions or, or comment on something. If I say something that uh, brings something to mind that you think might be helpful, please, please interrupt me. Okay, so... We could just, it, it should be plain that, that we don't just sit there and meditate our way into conformity with the Lord Jesus Christ, right? God did not call us just to sit and to live some sedentary life uh, and just think our way into holiness. No, rather he has called us to be doers. And so we do stuff, right? God has called us to active lives in our own spheres of influence and using the God-given faculties and natural abilities that you have and you have and you have. And everyone's got some different mix of things. And God has equipped you for the things that he has called you in particular to do. So he's called us to active lives of contribution and love. And then here's the, here's the interesting part. So I think that who we are determines what we do. Yeah, our character how God has equipped us, the natural abilities that he's given us cause us to do certain things and to attempt to glorify God in what we do. Don't you agree with that? So that kind of completes the diagram, right? Okay, there's my, yes, sir. How would you complete the diagram in the back? Yeah, exactly. You see, Okay, this is the link that's tough for us, I think, right, is to admit that actually the things that we're doing come back to us and form us as well. In fact, this is, this is actually what God does through our life experience, the reproofs of life, for example. He brings us through experiences to mold us and to make us, and so we have this sort of circularity going on who I am what I do is an expression of who I am and yet those things actually come back and change me okay and there are all kinds of analogies you could think about um, uh, and I don't want to get too far into this because there's some I want to use later but one a, a quick one in a book that I've been reading uh, talks about a shovel okay I want to I want to put holes in the ground so I, I buy a shovel to change that thing, and I'm doing digging to, to put a hole in the ground. Am I changing myself? Yeah, yeah, just look at my hands after about 30 minutes. You better believe I'm changing myself. That's exactly right. I got call calluses and then blisters, and then I'm in pain and the whole thing. So that activity, and then eventually it makes me stronger. Yeah. So the activity itself actually changes me, and that's part of that. I'm going to come back to this and... Uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to use this simple diagram in several places during this study. Um, yes, sir? Yeah, amen. That's exactly right. That's what I was, I'm trying to express, and that's much more succinctly done. Thank you. Yeah, that is the process of sanctification. And God is orchestrating things around us to bring us into that person that he wants us to be.
that's right. That's exactly right. We're going to get much more into that when we start to talk about um, the information technologies that are presented, the, the web in particular, uh, and its effect on us down the road a little ways. This stuff's very real. And the, the interesting part about it is we're still learning. We don't actually know. <laughs> you know. At the same time that we're all doing this stuff, people are trying to study, well, how is this actually affecting us? Because we just said yes. Yeah, we're into it. I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's just what we did. We just said yes. Okay. So anyway, that's what makes this so uh, interesting to me and uh, I think a, a, a very serious subject for us to think about. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, for us in particular, we certainly have Holy Spirit influence, um, yeah, molding us and making us uh, outside of, I, I want to be a little bit careful here, through the things that we're doing and also influen influencing our hearts directly, I'll just say that. And I don't want to get into the word and all that stuff, of course. All right, so it's a simple diagram. Just cut me some slack here, please. <laughs> <laughs> We're all modelers, aren't we? Okay, let's see. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Uh, let's see. It's only appropriate that I just lost control of my dumb technology here. So. All right. So just to reinforce this point briefly, let's flip to Philippians. Um, Chapter 2, again, these verses are, are very familiar to us, but I think they remind us of this reality of sanctification. Verse 12, chapter 2 in Philippians, Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's the this part, you know. Get to work. You're working it out, and we know we're not working for our salvation. Okay, I'm not, not going to get into all that. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So he's using that stuff that you're doing. He's working in you to form his character uh, in you by the Holy Spirit and all the rest of that. So just a little biblical something to pin on this idea. So... The Holy Spirit does not typically transform us while we're sleeping, although he certainly can, but instead he uses everyday life to mold us and to make us according to his purposes and plans. Amen. Because we do a fine job of messing it up ourselves. So this connection between who we are and what we do is absolutely essential uh, to a study of technology, uh, as we're going to see here in the coming weeks. Um, I think we're more prone to accept this part because we're by nature sort of, we accept our, uh, that we're in control, <laughs> okay? Yeah, I choose to do this, I'm affecting that. But then this part that, okay, that circles back and affects me, we're a little less willing sometimes to acknowledge, oh yeah, maybe, and maybe those are in some ways I didn't expect, didn't know, or don't want. And that's a little bit of just acknowledging some of the reality. And I think we're a little less prone to do that just in our natural states. So uh, more on that to follow. Okay, so what, what then are we actually to do? What are we to do? That's what I want to consider now. So how are we to organize our lives of activity so that we grow into the character of Christ and so that God's glory is most manifested? Uh, we have the word of God, do we not, to help us in that task. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and following. What is man to do with himself? And I use the uh, term man to mean humanity, of course. Not ma man as in the male gender. Okay, so uh, first, let's just read this, chapter... Uh, Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion 
over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then, of course, the uh, uh, rest of that you're, you're well familiar with. So what is this idea of dominion then? That's, that's this sort of first task that's given to man is this idea of take dominion. So if you think about this word, uh, the Hebrew um, doesn't really give us any rich insight, as Hebrew often does not. It's not really a technical language like Greek is. That, and, uh, so the, the idea behind it is really just rule or dominion. Um, but if you think about how we use that word in English, I'll just read a little bit from Webster's famous 1828, that... Uh, dominion is sovereign or supreme authority, the power of governing and controlling. Or a second definition, it is the power to direct, control, use, and dispose of at pleasure the right of possession and use without being accountable as, as the private dominion of individuals. That's a, uh, an example of how we might use the term. So I think it's the second definition that's closer to the biblical idea, except that we still do have accountability. It's not that we're exercising dominion with no uh, accountability upon the earth. God certainly did not do that uh, to us when he gave us the task to exercise dominion. However, we do have a God-given power to direct, control, use, and dispose of the creation at our pleasure, but not without being account accountable, as I said. That's the difference. So let, I want to unpack this just for a minute if you look at this passage just a bit. So first, note the connection between being made in God's image and taking dominion. The one follows right after the other. If you look there, okay, let's make man in our image and let them have dominion. Because God in his nature is sovereign, right? And he has dominion over all things. And so he makes man in his image and says, hey, you have dominion. Here's the earth. So he has delegated to us, as it were, dominion over the earth as an expression of our being made in his image. And so it's just sort of in us to want to take dominion over things. Okay, it's just in us. That's part of our nature. And we ought to embrace that and give thanks for it. So as we consider the ideas of technology and all the stuff that we invent and all the wacky, crazy things that we're encountering today, almost all of it we ought to just marvel at and give thanks for it. And in that sense, it is so cool, as my kids say, you know? And it's part, it's an expression of our being made in God's image, I think, that we're exercising dominion. And that's what God has uh, appointed us to do back here in uh, Genesis. So um, second, as image bearers, our exercise of dominion must not be, uh, must be unto the Lord and not unto man. So that's part of being given or delegated. That delegation to us gives us a responsibility. Now we're not doing this for ourselves. And of course, elsewhere in the scriptures, all over. Right? We're to glorify God in all that we do. And we are living life as unto the Lord and not unto ourselves. Okay, We can benefit from it for sure. And certainly as we take joy in things, God is glorified. And yet his glory is the big picture. I want to circle back to that first idea that we established at the beginning. So in our dominion taking, we must always have service to God and manifesting his greatness foremost in our minds. Okay? Foremost in our minds. Uh, hang on just a second. Okay. So it's here, of course, that the devil made his inroads with Adam and Eve. God gave the responsibility of tending the garden, uh, exercising dominion, as we'll see in a minute, uh, with very specific boundaries. Okay. I give you all these trees. You're to work the garden. But that tree there, you can't eat from that tree. And he gave us a boundary. And, of course, we violated that. Um, in the garden. 
So man's attempted autonomy or his attempt at autonomy or self-rule um, or saying I'm in charge here was the result of this fall. Um, Rushton, he has a nice quote on this. He says, as a result of the fall, man's urge to dominion is now a perverted one, no longer an exercise of power under God and to his glory, but a desire actually to be God. And so the fall, as we're going to see, really mixes in here that um, that act of the fall, which was an attempt at, at autonomy, now colors our dominion taking. And so we're, we're naturally bent in the sinful way naturally bent to serve ourselves irrespective of, of God's uh, glory and nature in the things that we do and in our dominion taking. We'll unpack this a little bit more when we talk about the Tower of Babel later, um, but we won't get to that today. Third, dominion is more than a command to man, and I've already established this, it's in its nature to seek it. That's the implication of, of image bearing. And so, as I said, we ought to just embrace that and run with it uh, as we have inclination to do so. And fourth, verse 28, if you look at that in particular, uh, says that we're not just to rule over the animals of the earth, but over the earth itself, for those of you who are sort of really looking at that at a fine level. So now, I'm, I'm not attempting a complete um, study on the subject of dominion. There have been books written on this subject. Um, but I do want to make a, just a couple of points about this passage and the subject itself, as a, again, as a foundation for what we're going to be studying. Um, first of all, our charge to subdue and rule over the earth does not confer absolute sovereignty. Okay, we're still subject to the laws of God and his will and his commands, and we're not absolutely sovereign. Our dominion is a trust and always subject to his will. Um, secondly, the overarching purpose of our dominion is still to glorify God and not to glorify ourselves. I've already said that. Therefore, we may not do whatever pleases us to the exclusion of God's purposes. Okay, now this is uh, a little, uh, something a little bit different that I've thought about recently. Uh, intimately connected to the subject of dominion, I think, is the subject of stewardship. And I think here Christians have sort of in the politics of our day, some, I'm sure no one here, but so probably some people that you know have, have sort of stiff-armed the whole sustainability movement, which is really just an extension of the uh, ecology movement in the 70s and all that, uh, and the tree huggers and all that kind of stuff, that we've kind of stiff-armed that as, oh, these earth worshipers and all this sort of thing. Well, uh, and, and I know in the politics of that, that's a complex subject, but, you know, Christians especially, okay, God has given us the earth as a trust, and I think the underlying ideas of the sustainability movement, which is basically we ought to hand the creation to our children in as good or better shape as when we found it, I think that's kind of not that controversial, right? Um, and so I think there's a common ground. We ought to really be passionate about stewarding the creation as Christians, you know? God has given us this precious thing. It all ought to be brought um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, into alignment, as it were, with his glory and with his purposes. And this is a precious, uh, the creation itself is a precious gift to us, so we ought to be very conscious of that. Uh, and again, especially in the sort of charged politics of the day. Now, there, there's silliness, of course, and all that. I, I don't want to get into all that uh, in the politics of it, but we ought to very much embrace, I think, this idea of sustainability, at least in the way that I just to find it. Hmm. Yeah, that's usually a good place to start, for sure. Um, so the earth still serves us, as it were. I mean, we're taking dominion over it, and in that sense, it's under us, and yet, Part of that is that we ought to preserve and take good care of it for the, the uh, goose that laid the golden egg, and that's if you know that story. Anyway, Okay, so as we think about technology in the coming weeks, um, we should keep these principles in our minds. Number one, God created us to rule over the earth and to subdue it. Number two, we're not only commanded to have dominion, it's in our nature to exercise that dominion. 
Number three, our dominion is given to us as a trust, ultimately to glorify God. Uh, and number four, we must ever have in our minds the principle of stewardship. Is it good for the earth? Is it good for man? Does it glorify God? These are the kinds of questions that we should be focusing on as we're evaluating technology and, and all that. Okay. Um, I've told this to some of you that whenever I teach, um, anybody know what my greatest fear is every time I teach? Have I told this to anybody? My greatest fear, whether here or uh, at the university, is that I'll run out of things to say before the bell rings. This is also my students' greatest hope. <laughs> it's funny how that works, isn't it? Uh, so, invariably, I have more stuff when I walk in than actually I need, but I'm still terrified that I'm going to run out of things to say. Um, now, right now, you're hoping, I hope he's done, because maybe he's actually, actually, I'm almost at the halfway mark, and we just have, <laughs> and we have 10 minutes to go, so I'm going to have to do this next part um, quickly, or think about, yeah, I'll push a little bit off this probably till next week. Okay, so we have um, established that we have dominion over the earth, and one of the points that we're going to make is that actually technology is, uh, and we're going to define it later, but technology is basically tools. It's things that we use to transform the earth and our experiences um, in dominion taking. That's basically the, the, that's it in a nutshell. We're going to get to a crisper definition later, but I wanted to at least connect why are we talking about dominion, what's the big deal with that? And the answer is that technology, as we're going to define it, is sort of a means by which we do this stuff, okay? And I, I hope that provides us some sort of basis for evaluating. Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? How should I use this thing, et cetera? How do I understand this circularity and all the rest of that? Okay, so we have been um, called, as I said, I, I just want to think about now one aspect of technology, and that is as it regards, as it affects our work. And I want to establish a couple of principles about work itself because so much of technology helps us do things in the work sense. Okay. I should have said this at the beginning. I'm not just defining technology. I don't have it on me. But, you know, as that little thing that's about this big and the bigger one is this big. Now, this is not technology for the sake of this study. This is a piece of technology. But we're, th we're going to think about it more broadly, okay, uh, because I think that will help us. Um, think more clearly about it. <clears throat> okay, so if you go back to Genesis 2, uh, or, or look forward to Genesis 2 here, God did not put Adam in the garden simply to enjoy it the way it was. Um, if you note, he put, it, uh, put him there to work it and to keep it. That is to maintain it and by extension to take dominion over it and to improve it. So if look at verse 15 and following. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Now imagine, this is a garden that God made. Wow. You can only imagine, you know. Ah, just let your mind go, go for that just for a minute. Wow, God made this garden. This is going to be some garden. But he put him there to work it and to keep it. Now either weeds were not part of the, uh, you know, weeds came from the fall. Either that was the case, okay, so he had no weeds, or weeds and upkeep was part of the plan, actually, right from the start. I'm not even going to postulate whether or not weeds were, were pre-fall or post-fall. Now, mosquitoes, I'm pretty sure about. But, <laughs> yeah. so, so in either case, though, he's either going to have to do things, and it's just in his nature, remember, he's, as he tends and keeps the garden, he's going to affect I, mean, I need something to dig this up. I'm going to grab a rock. And then, you know, next thing you know, he's got something that looks like a, a little shovel or a spade and all the rest of that. Okay? So he's going to, or maybe if he doesn't have to deal with the maintenance part, he's going to think, you know what? I had a nice bridge to get right over the creek right there. That used to be great. God said, all right, take dominion there. Go for that. Build yourself a bridge. Do that. And so he's going to, out of his sort of nature again, God says, keep it, make it, 
Take care of it. Okay, that was the original task given to man. And this is before the fall. So point number one is work. Most of you know this. Work is not a curse. Okay? We don't have to work because of the fall of man. Okay? Work was given to man as part of his dominion taking. And that's, that's why we're here, is to work. Um, so work is not a curse. God himself worked for six days and then he rested, right? That's our example. God worked. And yet in the midst of that work, God established boundaries. Again, he, he gave him one tree that he was not to partake of. So our work is still subject to God's laws, um, just like Adam's work was subject to the laws of God as well. So now let's look a little bit. So that, that, that just the main point there is that work is not a curse. And yet work was part of the curse. So if you look here at, at chapter 3 in Genesis, verse 17, let's see what happened to work. Um, okay, this is after the fall. I'm not going to read through all that. Uh, God then addresses um, the serpent. Then he addresses the woman in verse 16. And then... Uh, if you look at verse 17, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so the burdensome part of work, the part that just gives us the struggle, and ugh, that part of it is the result of the fall. Okay. Um, actually, the thorns and thistles part there, I just read that and thinking about the weeds, but anyway, I don't want to get, get into that. Um, so work is not... Just observe a couple things. Number one, the ground is now cursed. Labor is going to be difficult and toilsome rather than joyful. Why is it that my work is a burden to my soul sometimes? Answer, sin. Okay, that's why. Fall of man. That's why I don't enjoy my work. I don't know what specific part of it, whether it's me, my sin, or just the nature of the fallen world, but that's the cause for me not enjoying my work. Number two, work is not universally burdensome. Okay? It's not universally burdensome, as we all know by our experience. In the same way that the fall of man did not make every one of man's acts sinful, but rather corrupted his nature entirely so that we cannot not sin. Okay, We cannot not sin. Uh, and that comes from our fallen nature. Um, in the same way, uh, the fall doesn't make every experience of work burdensome, but it makes it impossible to be to rid work entirely of some burden. So I am going to have some struggle. So I, when I get out in the garden and I'm doing this stuff, I'm going to have a great time. It's a beautiful spring day. You know, it's, it's perfect weather. And what happens? You know, I'm turning the soil. I hit the rock. I always hit the rock. And it's always this big. And I can't move it. And it's right, you know, all the rest of that. So that's the, I am going to encounter struggle in my work. And that's, that is the reality of working in a fallen world. And yet, those are exactly the kinds of things that then cause me to create stuff to lessen the burden of work, okay? And try to relieve myself. That's why I come up with witty inventions. I invent a shovel, not a pickaxe. I've got you know, a jackhammer. I invent all that stuff to kind of relieve myself of the burden of work. And I can see I'm not going to finish this here today. So let me just read one last uh, uh, verse, and then I'll defer the rest of this discussion um, until next time. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This is uh, right after Proverbs. <coughs> Psalms in the middle of your Bibles, Proverbs right next, and then Ecclesiastes chapter 3, um, verse 12 and following. This is a very complex book, as many of you know, and it must be interpreted carefully. However, I think this is uh, um, because of the nature of what the author is wrestling with. 
and yet I think this is in its plainest reading um, thoroughly biblical. Verse 13, chapter 3, I was sorry, 12, I'm sorry. I perceive that, that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. And it is a gift, is it not? Just the simple pleasure of eating and drinking and working and enjoying our work is a great gift from God. And if you flip over to uh, uh, verse 22, so I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. And there is a satisfaction, as we'll see next time, just in doing work. And the reason I'm talking about work is that a lot of the stuff we're going to do, a lot of the technologies we're going to evaluate and think about, actually have as part of their purpose to relieve some of the burden of work. And we ought to give thanks for that and recognize that. Um, at the same time, that we'll talk about a bunch of warnings I very much want to have a balanced discussion about technology and acknowledge there's some just absolutely great um, parts of technology. It's easy for us to pine for the 1860s, you know, until we start to think about what life really was like in the 1860s, okay? It would have been much different, uh, in many ways better, in many ways uh, much more difficult. So. Um, all right, much more to say on that. Any questions or closing thoughts? So we didn't get much technology. We're going to, uh, next time, um, I'll clean up just a little bit of this, what I'm doing, and then we're going to actually try to define technology in some helpful ways and think about different classes of technology uh, and then hopefully get to a scheme to evaluate it um, as we move along. Okay, let's pray. Our Father, um, we thank you for the, the high calling and the task of taking and exercising dominion upon the earth and for your giving us the freedom to build that bridge, as it were, um, and to uh, return those things then to you uh, as an act of worship and praise and thanksgiving. And I pray that you would help us to think rightly about glorifying you in our interactions with technology and make us wise uh, in these difficult times, we ask. We rely upon the Spirit and the Word working through us to affect that all. And we look to you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen.